Amen. Know that God forgives you. That he has set you free. There are burdens you don't have to carry on with from here today because you've laid them at the foot of the cross. God is good. He is worthy of it all. Amen. Choices and consequences. Huh. Our choices have consequences, yes? Sometimes the choices we make, the outcome is the consequences are good. Sometimes the choices we make, those consequences aren't quite so good for us. In between playing the golf circuit when I was younger, I worked at Victoria Park Market. I need the clicker. And often I would have to be there like first thing in the morning. So that's like 6.30, 7 o'clock. I'd be the first person on the block, if you like. No one else there. And when I arrived, you know, Victoria Park Market in those days was circled with a three-meter high fence with spikes on it. And I would pride myself on my athletic ability to scale that fence and leap off the top. Yeah, I know, it was fantastic. I was very proud of myself. And I could do that day after day, no problem at all. But one day, one day, I stood at the top of the fence and I took my leap, but it didn't go like it used to. I slipped. And as I slipped, I fell over and the spike on the top of the fence went through this ankle right here. And I was hanging upside down off the fence with a spike through my ankle. I couldn't touch the ground. I was just hanging. Nobody else is around. I'm the first idiot on the block. And so I have to grab the fence and I have to work my way back up the fence to lift my foot off, which I did, and then I fall to the ground. I see the hole in my ankle, which goes all the way through. And I'm like, wow. It didn't hurt at that point. Made one made to the room, sat down. Ten minutes later, mm, that foot couldn't get within 12 inches of the ground. The pain was unbelievable. I made a choice, didn't I, to jump the fence. And this time the choice had a bad outcome. So I went to the doctor. And he fixed me up and gave me some antibiotics. And he said, young man, you need to take that whole course of antibiotics. But I was a young man. I was fit and strong. And I knew better than the doctor. So after a couple of days, I thought, this is going just fine. I don't need the antibiotics. I don't want that stuff in my system. I can fight this. A couple of days later, my legs started changing color. Sarah took me to the doctor again. And he yelled at me. You don't yell at a young man. I'm sensitive. He yelled at me and put me on a stronger course of antibiotics. And he said, you don't finish this lot. Because I was at the, that choice to not take antibiotics was just about going to cost me my leg and maybe my life. So this had to happen. And so as we, as we dive into the book of Romans today, <laughs> choices and consequences. Ultimately, it's about a, ch about a choice of believing in the things that God has shown and made known to us and believing in it, making that choice, or making the choice to see the things that God has made known and rejecting it. It's a choice between these two. Now, just a, a warning. I've been sitting with this one all week. This is a tough passage. It's a tough, if, if, how many of you read it? I, I put it out there to read. Yeah, you read it and you've gone, oh my goodness. Glad I'm not doing that one today. <laughs> yeah, I wish I wasn't. <laughs> because some of you won't like what I've got to say. And you won't like it because maybe there are some things you're struggling with in your life. And, and this touches on that point. Or maybe you know some friends or family members who are going through some things. And, and what I'm going to talk about today at one point in this message will touch on some of that. And, and, and you're sensitive to that. And I just want to acknowledge that this morning. And I want to say this about this church. It doesn't matter what you walk through that door with on your shoulders. You're welcome here. You're welcome here. You're welcome here. Let me put some context uh, to this passage on Romans. So 
Paul's been writing this letter to the church in Rome. He's in Corinth, actually. He's been traveling for 25 years and planting churches through the Mediterranean. And these churches are good, thriving churches. They're going well. And he's crafted out his biblical theology, what he thinks about the Bible, in the trenches, in the footpaths of the Mediterranean. I heard a, you heard a good message the other, the other day about this kind of thing, where it said, you know, you can get a degree at, at Kerry Bible College, you can get a degree at Laidlaw, but actually your degree is smashed out on the coalface. That's where you ask the questions about, how does my faith interact with somebody who doesn't have a home? How does my faith interact with somebody who doesn't have food on the table? How does my faith interact with somebody who can't have children? How, how do I answer these questions? Well, the best place to answer those questions is on the ground, in the coalface, with people. You don't learn it in a classroom. This is what Paul's been doing. And now he's sitting in Corinth, he's taking a break. He's resting, and he's pondering all these things that he has learnt. And what it means for the church today. We know that uh, in Rome, um, the church, it said, started in the synagogues. Now, if you go back to Acts chapter 1, we know the Holy Spirit came that day upon the disciples. Peter went out and preached and, and 3,000 odd people came to the Lord that day. Well, it's believed that in that crowd were Roman men and women who went back to Rome and took what they believed about Jesus into the synagogue, and so that's where the church started. Now, Rome at that time had a large Jewish population and a very large Christian Jewish population. There were Gentile Christians. Now, if you don't know the difference between what a, what a Gentile is and a Jewish, which Jews are obvious, right? We know who Jews are, but Gentiles are people like us who are not Jewish. We don't have any Jewish tradition. We're not born um, from any lineage that comes from um, a Jewish culture, so we are what we, the Bible would call Gentiles. The Gentile Christians in Rome came from the ranks of what they called the god -fearers. The god were Gentiles who went to the synagogue and worshipped there. They weren't fully-fledged Jews because they weren't circumcised, but they followed the teachings of Judaism and attended the synagogue. The Gentile Christians in Rome were the minority group until AD 49, when the emperor in Rome got really hacked off with the Christians who were uh, the Jewish Christians who were arguing about Christ. And so he put an edict together that said, "All Jews must leave Rome." So they all had to go. And overnight, the church in Rome became a Gentile Christian church. A few years later, when the when the Jewish Christians came back into Rome, they were now the minority group in the church. You can imagine, couldn't you? The Jewish Christians with all their wonderful biblical background and history that they can draw from, and these Gentiles, these Gentile Christians, you can imagine ooh, the tension in the church at that time, couldn't you? So this is the context. So Paul is in Corinth resting, and he's writing about all of the theology that he's learned on the ground. Are you with me so far? How many just with me as well? All right. Okay, so our passage is in Romans chapter 1. We're at verse 18 to 32. Um, and we're going to start. I want to read to you Romans 1, 18 through to 20. We're going to start there. But listen really carefully. This stuff's really tough. The wrath of God. Now, the wrath, just, just so you understand what wrath is, wrath is the righteous anger of God against sin. So he's angry against sin. It's not a feeling. He's actually angry, angry against sin. It's, an unrighteous, it's a righteous anger. The wrath of God has been revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Wow. Can we have one arm up in the air on this, in that area there? Does someone put an arm up? Anybody? Thank you. One arm there. One arm in this area up, please. Just someone put an arm up. 
Throw an arm up. Anybody? Thank you. One there. One arm up in there. Thank you. And one arm over there. Someone, there we go. Thank you. All right. So we're going to talk about, just keep those arms up. We're going to talk just briefly about what God has said here. He's, he's saying that what is known about God has, can be clearly seen. It can be clearly seen in nature. So over here, it's like a beacon of light that points to the knowledge of God. So over here, I look at this beacon of light and I go, I can see creation. You know what? I see the, I see the mountains, I see the islands, I see the palm trees, I see the forest, and I go, wow, this has clearly been made. God has shown me through creation who he is. Thank you. Then I look over here. And I go, well, I look into the skies, I see the stars, I see the moon and the sun, and I see how we have night and day, and it just continues like clockwork over and over and over, and I see God's handiwork and creation that way. Over here, I look at a newborn baby, and I go, oh my goodness, this is a miracle, right? You see a newborn baby, you see them, and you know they're going to grow into somebody, they're going to think, they're going to act. They're going to do things. They're going to impact people's lives. This is a miracle. I see God's hand in creation. Thank you. And then I look over here and I go, man, I look at the animal kingdom. I'm not saying anything, brother. (laughs) But I know you're feeling it. I look at the animal kingdom and I look at the species and I look how they multiply and I look how they live and move and I go, wow, I see God's hand in all of that. Thank you. We look and we can see and know the knowledge of God and His handiwork. And what this passage is saying is that people can see it. They see the light. They see the beacon of what God is doing in the world. And then they suppress it. And they say, I want nothing to do with it. This is wickedness. This is godlessness. They see it, but they do not choose to follow it. And there are consequences that come because of that, which we're going to read about. If you want to know what salvation is, then you have to know how bad sin is. Sin is the measure of salvation. Now, we're going to read some more passages, and as we read them, there are three things that we're going to notice here. I'm going to put up a chart in a second, but first is the knowledge of God, the rejection of that knowledge, and the results of that rejection. So I've made a chart for you, which you probably won't be able to read. But you just got to know I made the chart for you, that's all. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm going re- to read it from my notes here. So, I mean, I can't see a thing. I can from here. But some of you guys have got better eyes than me. So let's go through some verses here. Verse 21, the knowledge of God. It says here that although they knew God, and then they rejected that knowledge, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him. They had the knowledge of God, but they didn't glorify him or give thanks. And so the result of that was their foolish hearts were darkened. Any light of God that was there was gone. Their hearts were darkened. Verse 22. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. The results of that rejection, they became fools, it says. And God gave them over. Listen to this expression three times. God gave them over in their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. God gave them over. That's the first one. Verse 25. The truth of God has been made known. Then they reject it. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator. Idol worship, right? They made idols of creation rather than the creator. The result of their rejection is because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Verse 28, the knowledge of God. They did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God. And the result of that rejection, he gave them over. Third time you've heard it now. He gave them over to a deprived mind to do that should not be done, to do what should not be done. And in verse 32, they know God's righteous decrees. That's his law. They continue to do these very things and approve of those who practice them. That's not of God's law. 
The result of this is that you therefore have no excuse. You who pass judgment, you condemn yourself. These are heavy passages, yeah? I want to read to you now. There are two lots of passages here that, that um, he, Paul talks about. The first one starts in verse 26 and 27, and it says this. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with one another, with other men, and received in themselves a due penalty for their error. Tough passage. What do we do with that? Well, let's start with this. If we go back into the context of the culture in which Paul is speaking, Greek culture in general tolerated and sometimes looked approvingly on homosexual relationships. It was right through the Mediterranean. The Jewish culture, however, condemned the practice. Now, the Jewish condemnation of homosexuality is drawn from the Old Testament and the creation narrative. That's where they draw it from. Paul looks at his culture in that day through the lens of the Old Testament and through, his, through a Jewish view. Now, Paul uses a word in this passage, the word natural. I don't know if you heard it. It says here, even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural. In the same way, men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for each other. The word natural here in this passage is the word natural as it was, was described by other Jewish writers to refer to the natural order of things ordained by God. And this takes us back to Genesis and to the creation narrative where God made man and woman and said a man would leave his parents and be united to his wife. The two shall become one, and then he commanded them to go and multiply. Paul's view in this passage, now I want you to understand, there are three other passages in the New Testament that talk to the subject, and four in the Old Testament that talk to the subject. We need to bring all of this into context, but we're not doing that today. We're giving you Paul's view here. Paul's view is that the homosexual relations violate the order of creation established by God. That's what he's saying. Now, I want you to understand this. The Bible does not brand a sinful homosexual orientation, nor does the Bible give a hierarchy of sins as being worse than any other. And in that note, I want to read to you from verse 29 to 31. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a deprived mind so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Let's just be clear right here, right now. We are called to offer the same love and hope to everybody, no matter how they come. No matter how they come regardless of their sin. Paul's trying to make a point here. He is looking out at his culture that day, and he's trying to make the point of how far people have moved away from God. That is the point he's making. And look, if you were to open a newspaper or to sit in front of the news and to look at those lists of sins... It wouldn't take long to acknowledge and to see all of those things active in our world today. And it wouldn't take you long to conclude how far as, as a world we have moved away from God. Paul's point here is this, 
is to say the foundational sin is that we have rejected God. And that is why God's wrath, His righteous anger, has to be revealed. Because in revealing His righteous anger, we are showing the need of salvation. Are you still with me? There are three ways in which God's righteous anger, His wrath, is revealed. Three ways. The first thing that we need to notice is the verse are the words, is revealed. So, if you remember last week, Simon preached out of Romans chapter 1, verses 16 to 17, which says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. You remember that? Okay, I'm just going to read it to you. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. That's us. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed is revealed then in verse 18 it says the wrath of god has been revealed now this is really interesting (laughs) because being revealed is god's answer to people who say you know what in the old testament god was a god of anger and wrath in the new testament god is a god of love that's bad theology people especially if you turn around and say well god was the same yesterday today and tomorrow Well, there's somewhere your theology got screwed up. The wrath of God, his righteous anger against sin, and his love are evident in the Old Testament. And his righteous anger and wrath and his love are evident in the New Testament. And it's relevant today. When you read this, being revealed, this is a continuous action. It doesn't stop. It's still being revealed today. His righteous anger and His love are being revealed today. Because He changes not. He's lenient on the sinner because of Jesus' death on the cross. But His attitude to sin hasn't changed. The gospel has made it possible. The good news of Jesus has made it possible to accept us, sinners, into a relationship with God. Death is revealed through the wrath of God. There are three ways in the book of Romans in which this unveiling or the revealing of the wrath of God is being revealed in the book of Romans. Three. Here's the first one. From Romans 5, we see that death is the judgment of God on the ungodless and the unrighteousness, and it all began with that dude Adam back in Genesis. Romans 5.15 says, For if many died by the trespasses of one man, namely, that's Adam, death is a result of God's wrath, his righteous anger against sin. And then in the the middle of Romans chapter 5 and verse 18, we see it again. Through one transgression, there resulted condemnation on all people. So the wrath of God has been revealed against human sin and universal death. Death is something we all face. It's a result of sin. It hasn't stopped. Here's the second thing. Universal futility and misery are revealing God's wrath. From Romans 8, we see that futility and misery are evident, evidence of God's wrath against human sin. Romans 8.18 says this, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Now just stop there for a second, right? Whatever you're facing now, there's a glory coming in Christ which will not compare to what you're going through now. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God, for the creation was subjected to futility. I think it means something like this in our fallen and broken world. I might plan for retirement and have my plans in place and then the day before I go to retire, I have a heart attack and all those plans seem futile. I might go and build a house for years and years and then I get it all set up and before I move in, lightning hits it 
and it burns to the ground and it all seems futile. All of creation is subject to futility. In Romans 8.20, we see here that, that um, the subjection to futility, we see where it comes from. The creation, it says, was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. This means that it's God who subjected this world to futility. You remember his words to Adam and Eve, now you need to toil with the ground. You know, when you're going to plant, you're going to have to pull out weeds. It's going to go, you and any of you are gardeners, you know it's, it's a futile exercise. I find it much better to run it over with a mower or spray it with weed spray. Because <laughs> as soon as you pull those suckers out, they're back next week. It seems futile, right? You know, Satan and Adam could not be the ones who did this because Paul said it was done in hope. And, and, and Satan and Adam never did this in hope. They just sinned. But God showed his wrath against sin and he subjected creation to this futility. But it's not the last word because it was done in hope. And it says here in Genesis 3.15, there would come a day when the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head. Jesus Christ has crushed the serpent's head. It is done. God subjecting creation to futility is a testimony to his wrath against sin. And then the third way that God is revealing his wrath against sin is the sinking degradation of humanity which is revealing God's wrath. You see three times in Romans there. Remember three times God gave them over. After describing the ungodliness and unrighteousness of people, he said this in verse 24, Therefore God gave them over, that's the first one, in their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with another. In other words, God reveals his wrath against sin by giving people over. In other words, if you know you're sinning and you choose to sin because you find that more desirable than following Jesus, then don't be surprised if you're given over completely to that. I don't think that's unfair. If you choose to sin and want to stay in that place, then God will give you over to it. Verse 26, because of this, God gave them over the second time to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sex relations for unnatural ones. And then in verse 28, furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a deprived mind so that they do, not ought, what, they do what ought not to be done. So these are the three ways that God's wrath, his righteous anger has been revealed in this age against the ungodliness and unrighteousness of humanity. It's still happening today. He's consigned all to death. He's subjected nature to this futility and he's given many over to the degradation of minds and hearts. Paul's putting his case forward. There's good news coming. God's wrath is always mingled with mercy and hope. Is God's only response to consign us to death, futility, and the degradation of our minds? No. No. There's a kindness in the midst of God's anger. God's always doing more than one thing. Jesus said this. He said, He causes the sun to rise on evil and good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. God does not give us over to a deprived mind. He gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit renews our minds. God warms us with his wrath. Warms us with his wrath. But he woos us with his kindness. And so we circle all the way back now to Romans 1, 16 to 17. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as is it written, the righteous will live by faith. 
God's wrath, his righteous anger, reveals the hope that we can have in him and our need of salvation. I wonder if God is speaking to you today. I wonder if he's warning you today. I wonder if in your pleasure he's wooing you into a deeper relationship with him. Don't misread the voice of God. Choices have consequences. Our hope and our salvation is in him. Let's pray together. Father, this is uh, one of the toughest passages I think I've ever had to read through, Lord, and it reminds me of the world in which we sit and opens my eyes to the fact of how far as a world we are moving away from you. And it reminds me also of how much we need you and your salvation and the hope that you bring into our lives. Restore to us, Lord, the hope of your salvation. Let us sit in the joy of your presence and in the glory of the hope that you bring into our lives. Help us to be strong, to reject, Lord, the sin that seeks to encompass us day in and day out. Help us to walk from it. But even if we fall, Lord, we know that you're there and that you love us and that you care for us and that you forgive us and you restore us day after day after day. <clears throat> and Lord, we re accept your restoring of our lives. You are our Lord and our Savior. And you we give praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.